Hello, and welcome to Home Space and Reason, a podcast about creating a home that thrives. Hi there, I'm Christina Browning, your host. If you know your home could be so much more than it is, I discuss home functionality, aesthetics, and automation. I am a realtor in Portland, Oregon, and a home functionality coach nationwide. I geek out on every subject imaginable regarding your home and yard, challenging you to think of your space differently to get the most out of every square foot. I pose questions for you to think through about your space and reason. This podcast is all positive, offering you virtual fist bumps and celebrating every win. Remember, there's no such thing as perfect, but you can still aim for your best every day. Follow along on social media under the handle Space and Reason. In this episode, let's discuss laundry room functionality, aesthetics, and automation. We'll also talk a good bit about the chore of laundry. Episode 36. Let's start by looking at the history of laundry for a minute. Soap made from ash, lye, and animal fats was rarely used before the 1700s and not easily attainable if you were poor. It was used only for tackling stains and not used in the whole wash. Stains or heavily soiled linens were treated at home by soaking laundry in lye before it got washed in the water of the local river. Using lye helped to whiten as well as cleanse and was only done once every few months. As populations grew and countries developed urban centers, the wooden wash tub became commonplace. You used it by scrubbing clothes inside it, often beaten and stirred. This was very hard labor and took a surprisingly long time. Get this. The entire process often took a few days. They would pre-wash, then soak for 24 hours, and finally wash for reals. And that process alone, by some accounts, took as long as 15 hours because of the need to continually reheat the lye via firewood to finish the washing, and then a long, drawn-out rinsing and drying process. People took pride in owning enough linen to avoid the need for frequent washes, which made it preferable for households to wash everything at the same time every few weeks. With this perspective, my laundry routine sounds so luxurious. (laughs) Fast forward to the Industrial Revolution when you might start recognizing a tool called the washboard. The washboard was small, portable, and effective quickly propelling it into the status of a household necessity. Its ease of use, coupled with the increasing accessibility and affordability of soap, fueled by society's growing awareness of health and hygiene, also helped to cement the notion of regular washing. This is evidenced by the popularity of the Monday wash day throughout the Victorian period, the logic being that clothes washed on Monday had plenty of time to be dried, pressed, aired, and folded before Sunday, often a holy day of worship and no work. In 1947, the first top-loading automatic washing machines were introduced by Whirlpool. Ten years later, GE introduced a washing machine equipped with five push buttons to control wash temperature, rinse temperature, agitation speed, and spin speed. When thinking about laundry, there are several ways to consider it. How the space itself feels and functions. If you have a routine and whether that is working for you or not. If you have employed hacks or shortcuts, and lastly, if you get help with it from your family or if this is a solo endeavor. 
I read some wonderful laundry hacks by Cool Mom Picks, and I thought it would be the most fun to start there because who doesn't enjoy a good shortcut if it works? I wanted to share three of them with you, and I'll link to them on the group Facebook page as well. First, let's talk socks. With one kid, it's pretty easy. You buy them the same kind of crew socks in the same exact color, so the matching is basically done for you. But if you're in a household with a lot of kids, you can imagine how many pairs of socks there are. So they recommend if you've got multiple kids with the same gender who are closish in age or size, they suggest getting them each slightly different socks. Why? Because you'll spend half your time trying to figure out whose socks are whose. And while yes, kids can share, it's just as easy to get kids different style socks and save yourself the bickering. I'd suggest doing this with underwear as well. If you've got kids very close in age or size, trust me on this one, she says. Get them each a bunch of the same color socks in their own style and your laundry sorting time and theirs will be cut down immensely. The second recommendation that I wanted to share from them was to give each person a specific laundry day and their own basket. When everyone in the house has their own dedicated laundry day, you won't have the issue of having to wait hours just to get that one pair of pants you wanted because of how many loads are being done in one day, and you won't have to worry about doing larger loads. The last one I wanted to share is to fold clothes inside out if that's how they come out of the dryer. This tip will totally depend on your personal level of OCD. I don't think I could personally do this because I may start convulsing, but not everyone is like me, thankfully. So this made sense in my brain, despite the fact that I can't check this box myself. I am so much like her. So much time is spent turning clothes right side out. Mostly it's because kids just pull their clothing off their body and dump it directly into their laundry basket or onto the floor. So in order to save time, they started folding everything just as it comes out of the dryer. She leaves socks turned outside in, shirts and leggings turned outside in or half in and half out. And guess what? She says she hasn't gotten one complaint. It gives her kids some fine motor practice and they're doing a little bit of extra work instead of the human being doing the laundry. Awesome. Thank you, Kristen and Liz, for these great three laundry hacks. Please know they also have a podcast called Spond, worth checking out if you haven't already. Join them for candid parenting culture discussions, non-judgy tips, and a good bit of humor. I'll put a link to their podcast in the podcast notes here. An earth-friendly laundry-related thing you can do is check out drops.com, D-R-O-P-P-S.com. They're a newer company disrupting the laundry detergent market with powerful cleaning pods, safer ingredients with plant-based cleaning solutions shipped directly to your door in a subscription service. No more giant plastic containers of heavy detergent that ends up in landfills or in the oceans. I think their motto is admirable. We believe that families can take simple steps to replace everyday products that are both eco-responsible and economical, which, if multiplied across a multitude of families, can have a measurable impact on the planet. So check out drops.com with two P's when you have a quick second. In an interesting article in Psychology Today by Seth Slater, he discusses how laundry washing strategies are predictive of stress levels. And I want to share part of this with you. He says, psychologically speaking, it may not matter whether you separate lights from darks, opt for a warm water or cold water wash, or how long you allow the spin cycle to run. But if you want to predict someone's overall personal stress level, simply ask one key question about the laundry. How often does it get done? 
most people tend to subscribe to one of two strategic methods for tackling chores and tasks of all kinds, including doing the laundry. There are the all at oncers and the little at a timers. All at oncers save the laundry up, tackle the wash all in one go, and then coast until the next time the wash needs to get done. All of it. Little at a timers are hardly ever done doing the laundry because they do smaller loads more frequently. It goes on to say, of the two camps of washing strategists, it's the little at a timers who are more likely to report feeling energized upon completion of their tasks. The all at oncers, on the other hand, are more likely to feel relieved. Translation Little at a timers are ready for more, but all at oncers are left feeling drained. Which, in behavioral terms, means that little at a timers have succeeded in rewarding themselves for their efforts and will therefore be more likely to want to repeat the behavior of laundry washing in the future, while the all at oncers have punished themselves and will be more likely to avoid future laundry chores whenever possible. If you're interested in reading the whole article, it's cited in the notes of this podcast. If we leave our clothes lying on the floor week after week, are we lazy? Is that a reflection of our lack of self-respect or lack of quick and easy spot to deposit our laundry near where we take it off? If you feel like the clothes on the floor are there because you absolutely hate laundry and therefore you avoid it, let's dig deeper and look at the functionality of your space and your actions around it and see how you can remove the irritants or change your routine to make it more pleasurable or at least less sucky. Notice how you feel when you're in there going through the motions. Like really pay attention. Maybe your detergent is hard to get to and it's kept in a spot that isn't practical. Maybe it drips on the floor. Maybe it drips on your washing machine. Maybe your laundry room is dark. Maybe your laundry room is in a closet at the end of your kitchen. So there is no space to even consider and lack of space is the irritant. All irritants could have remedies for this chore to become less irritating or go away completely. This is the dissection that you're aiming for, the thinking about thinking. Create a space you want to spend time in and it'll promote happiness. Growth only happens outside of your comfort zone. It feels awkward and uncomfortable doing things differently the first few times, and it's because your subconscious is fighting to keep you in the safe zone of what it knows, which is what you have done in the past. But when you push past that, that discomfort, you'll develop a new comfort zone and a new, easier, and more enjoyable process. Using automation or a smart home device is super helpful in making a new routine a habit. I use my Echo for weekly reminders of things I want to do. When I have the idea, I set up my intention. Let's say it's to do laundry every Tuesday and Saturday, for example. I can add that reminder for myself to my smart home device. So as I'm having coffee on Tuesday morning, It will remind me of my intention and I will start a load in the wash. I'm going to read you part of a story from Magnolia written by Joanna Gaines because it follows right along with my philosophy of addressing all the things you need to make a space feel good, which then makes the chore part of it not feel much of a chore at all. She writes, When we think about the rooms in our home that we want to thoughtfully design and decorate, the laundry room is one that tends to get lost on the list of priorities. But we often end up spending a lot of time in this space. And because it affects how our family functions and stays organized, it will always serve an important purpose in the home. For the longest time, I did my family's laundry in a closet beneath the stairs where there was enough space for only one basket of clothes. 
As our children grew older and the laundry pile grew taller each day, I realized that although the laundry may be here to stay, I could change the environment in which I did it. So I added thoughtful details to that little space wherever I could. A few years ago, we decided to build an addition onto our farmhouse. I thought it would be a great opportunity for an expanded laundry room. For me, it wasn't the square footage that gave the room additional purpose. It was the way I approached designing the space and the things I included that made it very personal to me. Potted plants, some of my favorite art pieces, and a stash of scented candles. I made it a place that felt like a retreat, and sure enough, it made the chore a whole lot more enjoyable. Of course, everyone's laundry space will vary, whether yours is a portion of a mudroom, a repurposed utility closet, or the corner of a room you use for something else entirely, you can make this area matter. Your transformation can be as simple as adding a functional feature, such as a stylish locker basket on an open shelf above the washer. Or you can simply display laundry detergents in attractive canisters. If a renovation is in the cards, consider a bold, happy tile for the floor or walls. There are many ways, big and small, to make your laundry room a place you actually want to be." End quote. I loved that part of the article because it's right on the money. She recommends choosing elements that are typically found in living quarters, such as art and plants, aesthetically pleasing lighting and attractive storage. You might have heard me mention this tip before, but it was a game changer for me and so I wanted to mention it again since it has to do specifically with laundry. We would often dry something that we shouldn't have and then suddenly my jeans don't fit anymore. So I got a magnetic dry erase marker and it lives on the side of my washer. When something goes in that can't be dried, I write it on the lid of the washer and then whomever puts the clothes in the dryer, even if it's me, will remember to take out those jeans and hang them dry while we're putting the rest of them into the dryer. Another tip to reduce drying time and conserve energy is to use wool dryer balls. This is a reusable alternative to disposable dryer sheets. They last for a thousand or so laundry loads, which can be between two to four years, depending on how much you do laundry. And you can add a few drops of essential oils for scenting to your laundry. And now for questions to ask yourself about your laundry space and your reason. How about you stand in front of your washer and dryer for these questions? They'll be easier to consider and answer. Question number one, do I like or dislike my laundry routine? Even if you don't have a routine as in I do laundry every Monday, maybe it's the process of where the dirty clothes go, where the clean clothes go, and how efficiently or inefficiently and quickly they get put away. If you feel like you're failing in one aspect of the things I just listed or you simply don't like it, dissect what part about it makes you grumpy and then just focus on that one part. How can I do this part differently, in a different location, on a different surface if it's folding, or am I doing this all myself and really the change I could make is getting some help? What if you poured your freshly dried laundry out on the carpet and yell, 10 minute family effort, I need my team and everyone in the family sits in a circle around the laundry and busts it out together. This would ensure that it's quick and everyone feels good because they're helping one another out. It may not work for every family, but for families with like teenagers, it might be a great exercise. Question number two, where am I doing this laundry and do I like this space? 
go stand there, look at it with a critical eye and going right along with this is what is the lighting like in here? Is it warm and low? Is it cool and bright? Do you feel energy here or depression? Do you like your light fixture? If the lighting isn't optimal, how can I improve it? Question number three, can I fold laundry in another space that I enjoy more? Maybe you fold it on your already made bed while you're listening to the Home Space and Reason podcast. Maybe you fold it on the couch while listening to your daughter practice her flute. Maybe you indulge in an audiobook. If you can pair something else with your laundry folding that makes it something you can look forward to, that may help the task be something you'll look forward to. Question number four. Will reorganizing the space help remove some of my irritants? Are the things I need most often in the easiest places to access? So is the detergent I use every time the most accessible? If not, in this process of reorganizing, could you change up where you keep it to help remove some of the rub in the task? Could I put in a wall-mounted fold-down ironing board and get it off the floor? I've seen some that come in a type of cabinet of sorts that have a shelf to store your iron as well. Maybe a couple of hours of pulling everything out of the whole space and putting it back in in a neat and thoughtful way while getting rid of anything you don't want or need could be just the refresher you want to feel better about the space and therefore better about the task. Question number five. Am I frustrated with laundry in part because even when I'm done, some of my clothes still stink? Part of this might be because mold and mildew can grow within 6 to 12 hours. 70% of laundry dirt is caused by body soils that are invisible to the eye, like sweat, skin cells, salt, and a waxy fat called sebum. If they aren't removed with an effective detergent, these soils can accumulate and settle into the fibers of our clothing and into the laundry machine itself. This is why it's important to use the right detergent for the job at hand. Each load might be slightly different. Hex, H-E-X, is eco-friendly, biodegradable, non-allergenic, and has another benefit. It adds an odor-fighting shield to fabrics so that, as the item dries, odors are actively prevented from developing again. There's a Canadian company called Sports Suds that makes a non-residue, non-fragranced powder effective in both hot and cold water. Tide also has come out with its own Tide Plus Febreze Sport Odor Defense Liquid Detergent and Pods. Additionally, there are cleaners for getting the stink out of the washer itself, like OxyClean Washing Machine Cleaner, which has over 571 five-star reviews at the time of publishing this podcast. Lastly, question number six. Is safety important to me coupled with when is the last time I pulled out my dryer and cleaned the ductwork behind it? The most common cause of dryer fires is failure to do a thorough cleaning because a lint trap in the front is not a foolproof method for catching all the lint. It gradually builds up and can catch fire in the heating element or exhaust duct. It can also affect the dryer's efficiency. As a realtor, I have been with my buyers at so many inspections where the inspector pulls out a long snake-like wad of lint crammed into the exhaust ductwork from years of not being cleaned out. This is scary since it's so flammable. So go have a look, pull your dryer out, Google it on YouTube, whatevs, and you'll rest easier knowing it's done. 
Also, bonus that you don't need to buy anything for this or go to the store. It's just a clean out. This is one thing you can do today or this weekend. Clean out the dryer duct. Speaking of real estate, if you know someone looking to buy or sell a home in the greater metro Portland, Oregon area, send them my way. The finest compliment I could ever receive is the confidence of your referral. Now back to the laundry. Maybe you have a laundry room that you don't even use as a laundry room. What's this that you speak of? You might be thinking right now. I've personally seen clients buy homes with fairly decent sized laundry rooms and then not put anything into the bottom cupboards along the wall and instead just pile laundry baskets on the countertop, which was originally intended to be a folding area. If this describes you, you might want to dissect why it is that you haven't really settled into this particular space. Would it help if you had labels on the drawers so it's less about out of sight, out of mind and forgetting what you have in the drawers? I get it. If something is tucked away, I will literally forget it's there. So I have a good bit of that hardwired into me too. In episode seven, I discussed laundry just a bit as it relates to dialogue in your household chores in general and learning how to tweak your tools, routine, and spaces so that you don't hate them. If you haven't yet listened to episode seven, I would recommend having a listen. There's an interesting article from Good Housekeeping from a laundry expert's perspective on the eight biggest do's and don'ts, which I'll list on our Home, Space, and Reason Facebook group page. If you haven't joined yet, do a search for Home, Space, and Reason on Facebook. It's a great place to post questions for me and chime in with like-minded people without the riffraff of the general Facebook population. If you're having trouble dissecting why your laundry room isn't working and you'd like my help, I offer a virtual coaching session. Go to my website, spaceandreason.com and click on the link, Imagine, followed by option one called Your Happy Place. This is also a great option if you're preparing your home for sale and want advice on what to do specific to your space to make it the most appealing to buyers. You can walk around the house with me on FaceTime and I can put together a full recommendation of changes to make it the best it can be. If you geek out on this stuff as much as I do, please take a quick second to write a review of the episode. When scrolling through a screen full of new podcasts, trying to decide which one to try, reviews help people decide to give this podcast a listen or not. I'm thankful that you too have decided you want to create a home that thrives, and I appreciate you. I'll meet you back here for the next episode. (laughs) 